So today I'm going to deal with uh, diffusion and specifically the atomic mechanism of diffusion. Now when we handle a solid there is a nice sensation of rigidity which implies that the atoms within are packed together and well bonded. So it becomes difficult to imagine how an atom could actually move through that solid. It would have to squeeze uh, through narrow gaps between the atoms and find a location where it is then as comfortable to sit as it was before it started moving. Now this squeezing process uh, leads to local distortions and therefore there is a barrier to the movement of atoms, an activation barrier, which we'll, we will go into next. Now here is an atom which is attempting to squeeze past other atoms but is faced with a barrier uh, and the height of the barrier is this activation free energy G star. So the probability of a successful jump is exponential minus G star upon K2. And the frequency with which it is attempting to get over this barrier is nu naught. So the frequency of successful jumps is simply nu naught times exponential minus G star upon KT. Now this is a free energy, so we can separate it into an activation entropy here and an activation enthalpy. And of course this term is independent of temperature, so we can identify that as uh, d naught in our diffusion equation. And the diffusion coefficient, which is proportional to the successful jump frequency, is then simply d naught, which is this term here, multiplied by exponential of minus h star upon kt. So this is a, the general form representing a diffusion coefficient. There's a constant here which is independent of temperature and obviously this term is dependent on temperature through an exponential and this is the activation enthalpy. Now, if I take the logarithm of this equation, then I get a relationship between the log of the diffusion coefficient and the inverse of the temperature. In other words, if I plot the log of the diffusion coefficient versus 1 upon t, I should get a straight line with a negative slope. And that is exactly what we see in practice. So I'm plotting the diffusion coefficient here, and bear in mind that this is a logarithmic scale against the inverse of temperature. And you can see that these are straight lines representing, for example, the diffusion coefficient for tungsten atoms in tungsten and iron atoms in iron, aluminum atoms in aluminum, and in this case it's carbon in iron. So they're all straight lines with negative slopes as expected from the diffusion equation. Now one thing I'd like you to notice is that the diffusion coefficient for carbon in iron is far greater at any given temperature than all of these um, data. So why does carbon diffuse so rapidly in iron compared with the diffusion of metal atoms inside metal? Well, the reason is that carbon is an interstitial atom. That means it sits inside the holes within the lattice of the iron atoms. It's a small atom. If you look here at the sizes of atoms and the atomic number, then these atoms are small relative to things like iron, aluminium, and so forth. So instead of occupying a site which would normally be occupied by iron, they actually occupy the holes within the lattice, and those holes are called interstices, and therefore carbon is called an interstitial atom. And the same applies to, for example, helium and boron and carbon and nitrogen in, in metallic materials. Now, given that it is a, a small atom, it's relatively easy for it to squeeze past barriers, but not only that, there's enough space in adjacent sites. There are many vacant interstitial sites into which it can jump and regain its uh, level of comfort. Uh, 
after it has pushed past some sort of an activation barrier. So there's no shortage of interstitial vacancies at the typical concentrations of interstitial atoms. And that is why the diffusion coefficient of interstitial atoms is so much greater than of substitutional atoms because the number of vacancies, the vacant sites for substitutional atoms is really minute of the order of 10 to the minus 6. So we can take advantage of the rapid diffusion of carbon in iron. Here, for example, uh, we have allowed carbon to diffuse into the surface of the iron. So you see this dark region is where the carbon has penetrated from a gaseous atmosphere into the solid. And the reason is that carbon hardens the steel. Okay? So we want a very high hardness on the surface and not a high hardness in the core of your component, simply because we want the core to have a level of toughness and ability to absorb impact. Whereas here we might want some sort of wear resistance. And I'll show you a couple of uh, applications where we need a hard surface and a relatively soft and tough core. Gears, and you can see that the teeth of the meshing gears rub against each other. So we need a very hard surface on this gear, uh, on the teeth of the gear, but we want a really tough material at the core. So gears are carburized and hardened on the surface and it, the same applies to certain bearings where again we have these rolling elements on top of uh, these rings and they're supporting quite heavy loads. So the contact pressure would be of the order of two gigapascals. Uh, so we need a hard surface but a relatively soft and tough core so that the bearing doesn't break under unusual loading. So carburizing uh, is used frequently in these kinds of applications and even nitriding because nitrogen is also an interstitial atom and you can make it diffuse into the surface of the steel very easily uh, compared with substitutional atoms. So that brings us to substitutional atoms which are relatively large and they have to displace the neighboring atoms in order to move from one side to another but there also needs to be a space into which they can jump and that's a vacancy on the substitutional lattice. Now the concentration of vacancies is usually very small of the order of 10 to the minus 6 or less. Uh, so people imagine that there must be a different mechanism by which atoms move inside the solid and one of those mechanisms is this uh, so-called ring diffusion where these atoms move in a concerted manner so that you exchange places. So the larger the ring, uh, the more atoms can participate in the concerted motion uh, and the activation energy becomes smaller, but the chances of getting more atoms in a correlated motion becomes smaller. Now, back in the early 1950s, there was huge controversy as to whether diffusion happens by a place exchange mechanism or by a vacancy mechanism. And that was solved by Kirkendall and Schmiegelkast with a brilliant experiment which I'll show you in the next slide. Now imagine that we create a diffusion couple in which we join an A-rich sample to another sample which is B-rich at an interface which is marked with inert markers. Uh, in this case, uh, if, if this is copper and this is nickel rich, then we would use molybdenum wires which are joined to the laboratory bench. So they identify a fixed position of the original interface. Now imagine that the diffusion coefficient of A in B is greater than of B in A, then we will get a greater diffusion flux towards the right than towards the left. If diffusion is occurring by place exchange, uh, 
then the position of the inert markers will remain fixed relative to the edges of the sample. But if it is happening by a vacancy mechanism, then there is a, a bigger flux of atoms going this way, and therefore you will end up with the sample actually moving with respect to the inert markers, moving with respect to the laboratory bench. So if this happens, then the diffusion mechanism is definitely one involving vacancies rather than place exchange, because place exchange would give you equal transport in both directions. And indeed, when Kirkendall and Schmiegelkast did this experiment, they found that the sample actually translated with respect to the laboratory bench. In other words, the position of the inert markers moved with a velocity uh, v. So, we know now that the mechanism of diffusion in the solid state uh, involves vacancy diffusion, a vacancy uh, movement. Now, obviously, if there is a net transport of mass in this direction, then there will be a net transport of vacancies in this direction. And those vacancies represent an excess concentration of vacancies, so they will tend to condense into pores, porosity. So we should find that this, this region here has a new range of pores following the diffusion experiment. So this slide illustrates the vacancies that form because you've got net transport of mass in this direction and because the diffusion is happening by a vacancy mechanism you will get an excess of vacancies onto this side which will then condense as pores. So my colleagues at uh, the Colorado School of Mines gave me these images where we have here copper layers and nickel layers before the diffusion experiment and when you look at what's happened after the diffusion experiment you see porosity created inside the copper layers because there is a net transport of copper into this direction uh, and um, because the diffusion coefficient of nickel in copper is smaller you tend to get more vacancies going into this direction and therefore they condense as pores. So this is a real effect and you can measure it using the inert markers and also the vacancies that form. And I'll show you an example where um, it's technologically important. So superconductors are uh, of the sort that we use in, for example, uh, MRI scanners in hospitals and so forth, are made from niobium tin, NB3SN, uh, a compound, NB3SN. But this compound itself is quite brittle. So what we do is we take pure niobium, which is very ductile, and we embed it inside bronze, which is a copper tin alloy, uh, and then draw it out into wires. All right, so this is a composite which is drawn out into wires. And then you heat up the material so that you form NB3SN by the tin reacting with the pure niobium to form the niobium tin compound. As a result, because of the different diffusion rates of niobium and tin, you end up with porosity being created around the filaments of the niobium tin compound. Okay? And this is because of the Kirkendall effect that I showed you earlier. Now, the materials that we generally use are not single crystals. They contain many, many millions of crystals. And between the crystals, we have boundaries because across that boundary, there is a change in crystallographic orientation. So the atoms in these boundaries don't fit together uh, very well with respect to the ordered arrangement of atoms in this crystal and another ordered arrangement of atoms in the adjacent crystal. So there is a bit more of free space in grain boundaries than in the perfect lattices here. Therefore, diffusion will happen more rapidly inside the boundaries or through the boundaries than in the perfect lattice. And 
I can illustrate to you why boundaries have a bit more space than the perfect lattice. Well, you can see here that we have two different crystals and in between we have a boundary and that boundary consists of an array of dislocations and dislocations have a greater amount of space available because they are elastic distortions of the lattice. And here, for example, is an edge dislocation with a lot of space underneath this extra half plane. So if you have an array of dislocations to describe the boundary between the crystals, then you will also have more free space within the grain boundary and therefore an easier diffusion path. So we expect the diffusion coefficient through the boundary to be greater than through the uh, perfect lattice. So we need to take account of defects such as grain boundaries in calculating the actual diffusion coefficient in a polycrystalline material which not only has good crystals with long range order but also grain boundaries with a lot of free space. Now this image shows you a sample which has been broken to illustrate uh, individual grains. And you can see that the shape of individual grains is really quite complicated and we can deal with that rigorously. However, today I'm going to treat them uh, in a very simplified manner, uh, like so, that we have here a grain and this is a grain boundary with a certain thickness delta, which would be of the order of one or two nanometers, all right? usually one nanometer. So uh, we can work out the amount of air, uh, volume or area occupied by the boundary compared with by the perfect lattice using simple geometry. Now suppose that the size of the grain is D, which is twice, uh, twice the radius here. So D is the diameter of the grain. And bearing in mind uh, that um, a grain boundary is shared between two crystals, we have a factor of a half here to work out the area of the grain boundary, which is 2 pi r delta into half. And we divide that by the area of the grain which is pi r squared. So this is delta over r or 2 delta over the diameter of the grain. So this is the ratio of the areas of the boundary and of the uh, long range ordered crystal. Now bearing in mind that a flux represents uh, the concentration moving through a particular plane of a certain area per unit time, we have to scale the flux that's going through this perfect crystal and the boundary by their areas. Now, since the grain boundary is really quite small compared with the crystals, we can just assume this to be um, the flux through the perfect crystal and we scale the flux through the grain boundary by the ratio of areas to delta upon D. So if we now uh, note that the flux is proportional to the diffusion coefficient times a concentration gradient, we can write that the actual diffusion coefficient through this composite structure is the diffusion coefficient through the perfect lattice and through the grain boundary, but scaled by this fraction here, which is the ratio of the area of the boundary to that of the grain. So this is quite a small number. Okay, so even though the diffusion coefficient through the boundary is very large, this is a small number. So if we plot uh, the log of the diffusion through the grain boundary versus 1 upon t as usual, we get a straight line like this, uh, with the diffusion coefficient being much greater than through the perfect lattice here, okay? Um, because the boundary has a lot more free volume. Now temperature increases in this direction and at very high temperatures because the area through which uh, flux can go through the perfect lattice is much greater than through the boundary. The diffusion coefficient for the perfect lattice dominates the effective diffusion coefficient. But at low temperatures diffusion through the perfect lattice becomes 
really small compared with through the boundary and therefore this effective diffusion coefficient follows the curve for grain boundary diffusion coefficient in terms of slope. So when we have a small grain size, the grain boundaries play a greater role in controlling the diffusion coefficient than when we have a very large grain size. And this has uh, immense technological implications, uh, which I'll illustrate. Now, you must have all seen uh, a schematic diagram of a large civil jet engine, where there are many different materials used. Uh, but uh, there is a region here which is very, very hot, uh, approaching 1500 degrees centigrade, uh, where we use special alloys known as nickel-based super alloys. And one of the issues, one of the important issues, is that at very high temperatures, uh, metallic materials will creep. And creep means that, look, uh, under a constant load, they will extend in length. And obviously that's not a good thing if you're operating a jet engine because, you know, the tolerances here are very, very um, small. So you want to minimize the creep rate of these nickel-based super alloys which operate at very, very high temperatures. Okay. Now the reason why we want very high temperatures is because the thermodynamic efficiency of the engine increases as you raise the maximum temperature. So there is a brilliant solution to creating the nickel base alloys in a condition which minimizes the creep rate. Okay? And uh, these are, what I'm going to tell you is completely routine now. Uh, so the technology has been applied to all aircraft engines. So here is the old type of turbine blade for operating in the hot zone of the engine, where you can see that it's a polycrystalline material with lots and lots of grain boundaries, equiex grains and lots of grain surface per unit volume. So these would creep quite, uh, quite rapidly, relatively rapidly, uh, meaning that you would have to replace them frequently because uh, diffusion through the grain boundaries is faster than diffusion through the perfect lattice. So the next step was to actually produce grains which are elongated along this direction so that you don't have grain boundaries normal to the stress direction. And this is now a directionally solidified blade which creeps at a much smaller rate than this polycrystalline equiaxed polycrystalline blade. But we still have grain boundaries which are parallel to the stress axis. So the ultimate solution is that you remove all the grain boundaries. You make the blade as a single crystal. So believe it or not, you know, all of the blades which operate in the hot zone of an engine are made from single crystals of these nickel-based superalloys. And you see this peculiar feature here. That is responsible for the liquid solidifying into a single crystal. What happens is that uh, this blade, uh, you know, the molten liquid inside the mold is drawn through a temperature gradient. So solidification starts here with many, many crystals, but they grow at different rates depending on their orientation. And one of them grows faster than the others and makes it through this spiral so that the rest of this solidifies as a single crystal. So I'm going to show you a simulation of the creation of that single crystal, uh, illustrating the spiral region uh, in the simulation. And the simulation is by my colleague uh, Hong Biao Dong at Leicester University. Uh, it is one of the most uh, viewed videos on my YouTube channel. So here you are. You can see that you start solidification as a polycrystal, but some crystals are growing more rapidly than others, and one of them makes it through the spiral so that the rest of the blade solidifies as a single crystal. So I'll show you that again. It's a very, very clever device which enables the turbine blade to solidify 
as a single crystal on a routine basis in a production factory. Now, uh, the creep rate is something that we want to minimize uh, the extension per unit time of a sample under load. And we know that there is an activation energy for diffusion, A star, and the creep rate will therefore depend on the diffusion coefficient. And the creep rate goes down when the activation energy is high. Now it turns out that there is a strong correlation between the activation energy for diffusion and the melting temperature of the material. So the activation energy is very high for something like tungsten. Uh, so if you looked at the creep rate of tungsten, it would be very, very small. So you can ask the question, you know, why don't we make turbine blades out of tungsten or iridium or niobium? Well, iridium is incredibly expensive. So we can rule that out. We only use that as a, an alloying element in the nickel-based superalloys uh, for different reasons. Uh, tungsten and niobium are candidates, but they suffer from one particular problem, and that is that they oxidize very easily. So tungsten and niobium oxidize very easily, whereas iridium is rare and expensive. Now, the old type of light bulb was made from tungsten filaments and you pass an electric current through the filament, becomes white hot and therefore emits light. And obviously the tungsten filament has to be protected because it reaches a temperature of the order of 3000 Kelvin. So inside the bulb we have an inert gas argon and that is why we can use the tungsten filament, which if you put it in a scanning electron microscope looks, looks like this but it would oxidize very easily if you lose the argon atmosphere, for example, if the bulb cracks. Now, niobium also has this problem that it oxidizes very rapidly, but uh, it has a major use, all right? And that use is quite different from uh, its effect it's a high activation energy for diffusion. So this is a, a niobium mine that I visited in Brazil. It's a very small mine, but it produces about 90% of all the niobium uh, in, in the world. And this is what niobium looks like. It's a, it's a metal. And one use uh, for niobium is in superconductors and for that you need highly pure niobium which is made by electron beam melting at the mine. Okay, so this is an electron beam melter which produces these large ingots of pure niobium which then goes into these superconductors that I mentioned earlier. But that accounts for a very small portion of the total niobium produced because very minute concentrations of niobium that is added to steel can dramatically change its properties. And that's because it forms very minute particles of niobium carbide, which then pin the grain boundaries and stop them from coarsening, stop the grains from coarsening, and therefore you get a massive improvement in the toughness and the strength of the material. So for example, all these pipelines uh, which are used for gas and oil transmission are made from niobium microalloyed steel. So the concentration of niobium in there is just of the order of 0.03 weight percent. And many uh, components in cars uh, are made from this kind of a steel where you have very fine precipitates of niobium carbide inside the body-centered cubic iron, giving you strength. So, uh, although niobium is not really used for high temperature applications because of its oxidation problem, uh, it has major uses. And the discovery of the effect of niobium in steel was in Britain, in Sheffield at British Steel, 
and it opened up a huge industry for niobium. Okay, so the niobium mines in Brazil didn't exist before then. Um, there are now about 40 billion tons of niobium microalloy steel in service, improving the quality of life. Okay, so this is truly a major discovery that was made at British Steel. Uh, on my YouTube channel, you can find videos showing you the path to the discovery of the microalloying effect of niobium carbide. Now, going back, uh, going back to one of my favorite slides, uh, where I show you uh, chunks of pure ice in salty water. They have different compositions, but they are in equilibrium with each other because uh, the chemical potentials of the components of ice and water are equal. Uh, and in this case, we are talking about an iron carbon system where the potential of iron and uh, of carbon is the same in the two phases here. So we draw a common tangent to find these chemical potentials. And there is no tendency for diffusion between the two phases because the free energies of the components are identical, even though their chemical compositions are different. Yeah, so this is summarized in the slide which you've seen before, that equilibrium is defined by saying that the chemical potential of each component in each phase is identical, irrespective of whether their components are identical. So in our ice water analogy, obviously Fick's law doesn't work because we have a concentration gradient between the ice and water and yet we have no diffusion because diffusion should strictly be driven by a free energy gradient and therefore we should write the flux as being proportional to the free energy gradient here and this is a different uh, proportionality constant than the diffusion coefficient. Now the way in which the chemical potential varies with distance can be expanded into the way in which the chemical potential changes its concentration multiplied by the gradient of concentration, which is the same as in Fick's law. So if we replace uh, this term here by a term like this, then we see that the diffusion coefficient can be written as CAMA into the way in which the chemical potential changes with concentration. Okay, So the diffusion coefficient is now a function of concentration because the chemical potential varies with concentration. So if we have a free energy curve which looks like this and I draw common tangents, uh, I draw tangents at two different concentrations with x2 being greater than x1, then it's clear that here the chemical potential of manganese increases as the concentration increases, which means that d mu by dc is positive for manganese. And that means that we will have a positive diffusion coefficient, which will be parallel also to a concentration gradient. Uh, so the mu by dc in this case is greater than zero, it's positive. On the other hand, if you have a free energy curve which looks like this, then as I increase the concentration of manganese, the chemical potential decreases. Uh, so the mu by dc is less than zero, and my diffusion coefficient becomes negative. Okay, So just to emphasize that, uh, a negative diffusion coefficient means that if at time zero I start off with a completely homogeneous material, there will be a tendency for unmixing, right? unseparation. So the homogeneous material will tend to develop composition waves which increase in amplitude. And the reason for that is that if I take a homogeneous sample and give it a perturbation of composition, then there is a reduction in free energy when the free energy curve looks like this. But that is not the case if the free energy curve looks like this. So here d mu by dc is negative and a homogeneous material will tend to develop these composition waves which increase in amplitude with time. And we call this spinodal decomposition or uphill diffusion because diffusion is happening opposite to a concentration gradient. Now I can illustrate that using a simulation here 
uh, of an iron chrome system where it started off as chemically homogeneous and you can see that it's developing chromium rich regions here. So iron chrome is a classical spinodal decomposition system where if you start off with a completely homogeneous alloy it will tend to decompose into chromium rich and chromium poor regions. The simulation at the bottom is completely different but it looks very similar to this. It's done by Carlos Martens who is uh, uh, a cosmologist and what he's showing is that the universe actually started off uh, as almost homogeneous after the Big Bang. Uh, every, uh, there was a uniform distribution of energy which means that there were no stars. The whole universe was dark for something like 100 million years. Those were the first dark ages. But then matter started to cluster rather like in a spinodal decomposition and we had the creation of stars, the first candles in the sky. Okay? So the clustering of matter in the universe and the clustering of chromium atoms in nine chromium atoms have some similarities. Okay? Now, there are some uses of alloys which undergo spinodal decomposition. So, uh, in order to be safe in areas where there are explosive gases, for example, in mines, you have to use tools which don't cause a spark. That means steel is not, uh, uh, steel spanners are not allowed. This uh, is a copper beryllium alloy, which uh, doesn't spark but it is still strong because of the precipitation of beryllium. However, beryllium is actually a very toxic metal. Here we have a copper nickel tin spinodal alloy, which before the spinodal you can draw it out, shape it into any, any particular shape that you want, and then uh, give it a heat treatment, which causes the development of these composition waves which strengthen the material. Okay. So there are some uses for spinodal alloys as well. Okay, so that completes our treatment of diffusion and in this particular lecture you've learned about the atomic mechanisms of diffusion and also how you can get uphill diffusion where a homogeneous sample will decompose into solute rich and solute poor regions. Thank you.